Exodus that's called the Book of the Covenant. The Book of the Covenant. And a lot of what we're going to be looking at today is the various laws that God gives to Israel while they're still at Sinai. Um, and as I mentioned before, there's there's going to be a, an accumulating of laws over time. But this is this is the stuff that God presents through Moses to the people first. So. Let's begin with uh, Exodus chapter 21, verses 22 to 25. This describes a special case, but it ends with a general principle. The general principle of the Old Testament, we also find this in other Near Eastern laws. Uh, let's have somebody read this, uh, 22 to 25. But if thou shalt indeed obey the voice and do all that I speak, then I will be an enemy unto thy enemy. You're in 21. Oh. Chapter <laughs> 21 we need, verse, starting verse 22. <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead, Mike. When, when men strive together and hit a pregnant woman so that her children come out, but there is no harm, the one who hit her shall surely be fined. As the woman's husband shall impose on her, and he shall, he shall pay as the judges determine. But if there is harm, then you shall pay life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, strength for strength. Okay, what's the, what's the general principle here of the law and how it's practiced? Eye for an eye. Eye for an eye. Have you heard that expression before? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. What does it mean? What's it, what is it about? It about? Retribution. Retribution. Okay. Payback. Payback. 21. Verse 12. Fairness. Yeah. Implication. It's also about fairness. Okay. Responsibility for the things that happen, for the things that you do. Okay, it's got all of those things going on. On the on the one hand, it sounds kind of harsh, doesn't it? No. Somebody knocks your eye out, you're gonna knock out their eye. <laughs> if you can see them. If you can see them. <laughs> okay. How could this possibly be an expression of mercy for the person? Could do a lot worse. Could do worse. What What's the worst thing you can do from, from taking somebody's eye? Kill them. Kill them. 
Okay. So this is a part of the thinking here, is that, is that the punishments are supposed to be fair. They're supposed to be just. And the punishment needs to fit the crime. You've heard this expression maybe in American law. Punishment needs to fit the crime. We don't want cruel and unusual punishment, right? We've heard of those expressions before. And this is a principle already here in the Old Testament. Uh, that the punishment should be fitting with the crime. So we have in this in this particular case, we have a uh, men who are striving and somebody hits a pregnant woman and that she loses her child and she has a, um, a miscarriage. In other words, um, there's going to be a fine against the man. Uh, but it, it sounds like uh, they might also... Uh, impose other possible harm. For example, verse 23, but if there is harm, then you shall pay life for life. Okay? Uh, we're going to see that uh, there can be different penalties imposed in, in uh, different cases depending on what the person injured requests. Okay? Um, when, uh, when we had to go to court here, earlier in the year, the judge was very interested in what we thought about the situation and uh, what we had to, to what input we would provide. And uh, there's, there's something similar to this happening with the Old Testament law as well. Any comments or questions on what you're hearing and seeing? Yeah, Jim. I just told him this big black sheriff, the arms that big guy, so what do you think about the death penalty? He said, bring it back. Bring it I back. Said, I agree with you. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll have to keep an eye out for it and see if that comes up in the Old Testament laws here. And what it comes up for. <coughs> what would be the penalty? When would that be the penalty? Okay. So keep an eye out for that. But remember this general principle. The, the punishment needs to fit the offense. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's have somebody read verses 26 and 27 with this question in mind. How valuable is an eye or a tooth? 26 and 27. And if a man smite the eye of his servant or the eye of his maid, and it perish, he shall let him go free for his eye's sake. And if he smite out his manservant's tooth or his maidservant's tooth, he shall let them go free for his tooth's sake. <laughs> okay. How valuable was a eye or a tooth? Pretty valuable. Pretty valuable. <laughs> the eye is more valuable. Say again? The eye is more valuable. The eye is more valuable? Um, yes. I I would certainly feel that way until uh, I had a stake in front of me, probably. <laughs> <laughs> At least you could see it. And then I could see it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I could see it, see it and, and smell it, uh, but if you can't chew it, it's hard to enjoy it, isn't it? <laughs> Only one tooth. <laughs> so, uh, so these these were very valuable. Uh, in, in ancient culture, there's no way to replace these things, is there? Today we've got dentistry. Dentists can do so many different things. Uh, eyes are still pretty valuable. <laughs> it's hard to do cha much changing with the eyes. Uh, there's a variety of procedures and stuff, but you can't just put a pop another eye in. Uh, so interesting what they were valuing at that time in that culture. Verses 28 to 32. When an ox gores a man or a woman to death, the ox shall be stoned, and its flesh shall not be eaten. But the owner of the ox shall not be liable. But if the ox has been accustomed to gore in the past, and its owners has its owner has been warned, but has not kept it in, and it kills a man or a woman, the ox shall be stoned, and the owner shall be put to death. If a ransom is imposed on him, then he shall give for the redemption of his life whatever is imposed on him. If it gores a man's son or daughter, he shall be dealt with according to the same rule. If the ox scores a slave, male or female, the owner shall give to the master 30 shekels of silver, and the ox shall be stoned. Okay, so here we have a, an ox that, that uh, loses it <laughs> and gets upset. Um, in the first instance, 
the uh, owner is not held liable for what the ox does. In the other cases, he is held liable. Why would the owner not be held liable there, according to verse 28? If it was his first time, and the owner had no recollection that he was going to do it, or that he was uh, that it was a possibility, then it wasn't as harsh. Okay, so the penalty wouldn't be as harsh in, in that case. Yeah. Um, yeah. I was talking with someone the other day. I forget who it was. But they were talking about uh, how they were they were out on a camping trip and they walked through this field and they got to the other side of the field and the, the fellow said, oh, where did you come from? And they said, oh, up, up this way. And uh, they said, well, did you see the big bull in that pasture? And, uh, and, and, uh, <laughs> and, and they said, no, we didn't, we didn't know he was out there. Um, and uh, the guy was like, well, you might have dodged the bullet. Because uh, that bull is not uh, not a, a friendly bull. Uh, he can be trouble. Um, yeah, bulls. Bulls. Uh, I, I've seen bulls that are, are very gentle on the farm. I've seen people hand feed their bulls. <laughs> How about a buffalo? How about a buffalo? I don't know much about buffaloes. I can tell you a lot about bulls, but not not so much about buffaloes. Uh, and then. Uh, the thing, with, the thing about a bull is uh, if they, if they uh, are feeling territorial, their minds can switch and they, and they can be dangerous. Uh, but here the, the character of the animal is in view, isn't it? The, the owner is supposed to know the animal and take precautions if the animal would be dangerous. And uh, uh, if, if, they, if they're being reckless, if they know the animal's dangerous, they they've got to act differently, don't they? But uh, they're getting they're getting a little bit of an out here if the animals behave, misbehaving for the first time. Go ahead, Brian. Yes, in the King James version, in chapter 28, uh, after the bull acts up, and it says it, and uh, his flesh shall not be eaten, but the owner of the ox shall be quick. I've never heard quick use that way. Okay. Yeah, and, and the, the current translations have not liable. So he's, he's, he's like acquitted. Okay. okay, so it's an older form or expression for something like acquitted. So he won't be held liable for the animal's behavior in that particular case. He's got insurance. He's got insurance. Uh, I don't know if they had insurance back then. <laughs> Uh, but it's it's very much a law about responsibility, isn't it? Knowing your property and minding your property for the sake of other people. Okay. Um, the the one mystery as I read this that I don't quite understand is they kill the ox and no one is allowed to eat it. And I'm not sure I understand that part of the law. If there's a reason behind it, um, I, I, I didn't see any explanations for that. So there's occasionally things you run into like this in the scriptures, and you and you're left to wonder. <laughs> yeah, Susan. Could it be the reason it was acting that way is because it was sick? It could be sick. Oh, mm. Like rabies. Yeah, like yeah, like if an animal gets rabies, it okay. acts differently. Okay. Sick, yeah, a, a rabid animal would definitely be a danger. You certainly wouldn't want to. And you wouldn't want to eat it. I agree. Yeah, uh, maybe that's maybe that's what's behind it. I was thinking, well, maybe maybe it's because uh, uh, they didn't want anybody rewarded with the with the meat or something like that if they were provoking the animal or something along those lines. But uh, yeah, well, my son taught. But I taught in Wyoming, and all these buffalo around the school, and these people get it jump over and take a picture with them. And right. They got the bull and they got the horn. Yes. There was no scorn. Yeah. They got the horn. Yeah, there, there, there was uh, in the last year or two a woman from Columbus who was out at uh, Yellowstone yeah. and got too close to one of those bison and uh, she didn't come home. 
They do that with elk and stuff. They think they're pets. They get yeah. Hard. Yeah. Yeah, if you've ever worked around large animals, you know they're, even, even when they're not trying to be dangerous, they're dangerous. <laughs> they are dangerous. I, I've been knocked around by cows on more than one occasion. They, they are so heavy and so big. And uh, Gretchen's laughing because she's maybe heard some of these silly stories. <laughs> it's a wonder I'm with you today. <laughs> <laughs> the next set of laws in the chapter here, uh, from verses uh, verse 33 down to 22:15, are about fines for liability or restitution. We're not going to read all of those. If you'd like to explore them, I encourage you to to do so. But do you see, they're trying to regulate the situation there that they're in at Mount Sinai and the things they're dealing with. But let's read. Uh, chapter 22, verses 16 to 17. Someone read that for us. Chapter 22, 16 to 17. And if a man entice a maid that is not betrothed, and lie with her, and shall surely endow her to be his wife. If her father utterly refuse to give her to him, he shall pay money according to the dowry of virgins. Okay. What's going on here? Shotgun wedding. Shotgun wedding. <laughs> I hope he's got money. <laughs> hope he's got money. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess I guess the guy is kind of sweet talking the young lady and uh, drawing her along. And uh, well. It's uh, who makes the decision about whether the marriage is going to happen or not. Father. The father's going to make that decision. Why would the father make that decision? What's that about? I think it depends upon the age also. <coughs> okay. Uh, if she's an older woman, I, I imagine because if she's under his household, he'd be in charge of her. But younger, definitely. Mm. Mm. That's what I think. Yeah. Well, I in 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 that in that culture, the 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 father has a responsibility for overseeing his household, and uh, I think I think that's a part of the reason that the father is the one who's going to be the decision maker. Now that doesn't mean he wouldn't consult his daughter and talk with her. Mm -hmm about the situation. There's a case similar to this in Genesis that we went over when we studied Genesis. Um, but in that case, it was actually that the man forced the young lady, which, so, which is a totally different thing. That's a different situation. In this case, he uses the word enticed. What does the King James have here, I wonder? Enticed. It does have enticed. So he's sweet-talking. He's sweet-talking her into the, into the relationship and uh, she she might be she might be out of her element, um, but uh, it's interesting they don't uh, they don't um, in the case of adultery we'll see in a different part of scripture if someone commits adultery they will take uh, they will take them out and stone them okay uh, that was punishment for adultery. But here, it's neither of them are married yet, apparently. Okay, and so it's it's not dealt with as severely. Go ahead, Brian. Uh, being stoned to death for adultery, did that apply to the men too? Sure, I think so. Okay. Yeah. There's, the only time I ever hear about it is when it's a woman. Right? Yeah. Yeah. You, it's the John chapter eight story that you're probably thinking of, where the woman is caught in adultery, yeah. and. Uh, uh, and then she's uh, that they're going to take her out and stone her, and they bring her to Jesus and test use that situation to test Jesus. Uh, but yes, men could be stoned f for adultery as well, as I, as I recall from the law of Moses. Yeah, he may, he may have had a buddy in the crowd, and there was an exception being made or something like that. I don't know, or it might be that he was not married, but she was. 
and maybe they treat that differently in the culture. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Go ahead. If she if she is no longer a virgin, does her value in the society change? I mean, is she like no longer able to marry or? I I don't know. I, I I'm sure she could marry. But you might find that uh, uh, when the family gets together to talk about the the wedding, that the uh, the dowry and all of that kind of stuff wouldn't be as as valuable. It might be that kind of a situation. Yeah. Did they? Excuse me. Did they have a lot of arranged marriages back then? Almost entirely, I would guess. So, yeah. if had plans for her, yes. would have changed things. Yes, and, and it's, it's interesting that you bring that up. Apparently, she's not betrothed to anyone yet, or maybe she's betrothed to this young man. I suppose that's a possibility. But betrothal in that culture is like a marriage. It's a contractual agreement. Uh, both families agree to it. And uh, so it sounds like maybe a situation that, where this is a younger woman, that's another reason why the father would definitely be involved. And uh, um, that, uh, because if she's betrothed, that's like being married, because there's a, there's a covenant commitment there. Uh, but she's apparently not in that situation as yet. Later on in the Law of Moses, they get into all kinds of details about uh, you know, if they were out in the field together and she was in a situation where nobody could hear her scream, you know, then, the, then they handled that situation this way or that way. Uh, they treat it in, in different ways. Um, they're trying to, <coughs> trying to do things in a, in a just way, uh, but uh, trying to discourage this sort of behavior all the while. Yeah, go ahead, Joe. Is, it, is there cultures nowadays who still practice this? I'm pretty sure there is. Practice what? Where the father, where the girl is already promised to someone mm. when they're young. Oh, yeah. India, India is very well known for prearranged <laughs> marriages, right. and the families do that. Um, are there are probably other cultures. I wouldn't be surprised if other parts of Asia and Africa. Does, so yeah. does this go back to the days of Moses where they still practice that law? That's what I'm trying to do. Yeah, I, I think the, the cultures, it wouldn't be necessarily the same culture as the Jews. They're a right. Semitic culture, and, and like India is, a, is quite a different culture. Um, but the, the ideas and the thinking about it are, are the same. The, the, the father, as the head of the household, has a responsibility for taking care of his household, and so he's involved in those decisions. And uh, he's... he's uh, He's the one that's signing the contract. And in these cultures, usually marriage is much more a financial relationship than necessarily a romantic relationship. In Western culture, we're all about the romance. It's a very different way of looking at marriage. We're all about the romance in Western culture to the point where the culture has gotten to the point, well, if you don't love them anymore, then you just give up. That's, that's the way the culture has gone. Uh, but that would not have been the case in this ancient culture and, and in, still in many other cultures in the world. Uh, you've made a commitment, and you're going to keep your commitment, is how they would emphasize it. Go ahead. Oh, yeah, just, when I was in high school, I had a friend that was Indian, and she negotiated with her parents because she was kind of a gold cast, and she, they wanted her to marry this other guy that was in the gold cast. Yes. And... Uh, she didn't really like him, but she liked this guy that was in the silver cast. So okay. she negotiated that she could still go to college, marry the guy in the silver cast, but she had to commit, like in high school, that she was going to do this before she was able to go to college. So yeah, I mean, it was still happening in the U.S. in I don't know modern day. Yes. Yeah, I'm sure. You know when it when it says that uh, that. Uh, that the, the father is making the decision. That doesn't mean that the mother and the daughter and yeah. other people in the household won't have an opinion <laughs> and that he might not hear about that and that's all he taken into account. He doesn't want to be account. completely miserable for the rest yes. of the Yes, <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, you, you know, these, these, you hear stories, read stories about, about these kinds of situations and, 
and the fears surrounding them. Yeah. Uh, but uh, but I'm, I'm sure that any reasonable family would be talking about those things and wouldn't just, uh, okay, here you go. It, you know, <laughs> although, although I hear about Indian families where the kids are really young yeah. and, and, uh, and the pairing is, is made by the parents. Especially if you have a family fortune to negotiate. Well, those are things that enter in as well, aren't they? The, the family wants things done a certain way, especially if they're heavily invested, so to speak. Yeah? My mother-in-law said to my wife, you're not marrying him. Can you imagine? <laughs> so she didn't go to the wedding. <laughs> oh, boy. Ready, <laughs> honey. Yeah. <laughs> So, so yeah, this gets this all can get very I mean, sensitive. All can. I mean, it can all get very sensitive. Yeah, beautiful person. Good <laughs> yeah, Israel doesn't have a caste system, but they can all count, right? They know how to count shekels, yeah. and uh, and that would have entered into people's thinking about all of this. I, I probably told you this story before. I, I had a student when I was in South Africa. And I heard through Facebook that he was getting married, and uh, he was trying to, to raise a bride price. And I went through a, a long thing trying to get the money. I, I was going to give a gift, trying to get that down to him. But uh, I, I checked with one of the other faculty members when I was uh, that I worked with down there, and he explained to me that uh, uh, the typical bride price is the equivalent of ten cows. And which is a huge expense, and this young man had a—he he said he had a, you know, long hill climb in order to marry the girl that he was expecting to marry. So, uh, uh, who knows? You you asked uh, you asked Doreen whether she might be might be less valuable. Maybe it would make it easier for her to marry somebody that she wanted to be with. <laughs> so it takes some of the money out of the equation. Yeah. <laughs> My cousin told me one time, I told you it was just as easy to fall in love with a rich one as it was a poor one, and you didn't listen. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Yeah. Yeah, and in our culture, men worry about uh, gold diggers. Right? That's, that's something that men in our culture tend to worry about. Uh, yeah, there's, it's, it's complicated, isn't it? Nothing more complicated than human relationships. <laughs> or very few things. If you can figure out the Rubik's Cube and do it in under a minute, that doesn't mean you'll be good at relationships. <laughs> oh, let's see. Um, why, why do we even have men? Why does it exist? It's, it's a, a, virtually a universal practice. It's found all throughout the world in almost every culture. Why, do we, why does it even exist? Why do we have it? Companionship. Companionship. Protects the women and the children. Protects women and children. Okay. Other biblical, thoughts? isn't it, bastards? Uh, for us, we would say it's biblical. Mm -hmm. Yes, God's Word teaches it. Other thoughts? That's why the Greeks were the first to have police to protect women. They, they had police to protect women? In their culture. They were okay. The yeah. It establishes a stable society, you know. Mm. Yeah. The federal government gets more tax revenue from married people. <laughs> Why? Because their relationship is more stable, more productive, tends to be. So yes, it, it does contribute to society in that way. But why get this why get the state involved at all? I love you, you love me. That's it. Who cares what everybody else thinks? My daughter's laughing at me. I'm inviting. I'm inviting you to think. I'm inviting. You to think. Could it be the almighty dollar? Could it be the almighty dollar uh, in this country? Well, think about it. If the relationship is not clear, what happens? 
to the household if the relationship ends. Unstable. Who? What belongs to who? It's it. It's the dollar. So there's a reason culturally why this is everywhere. There's a reason it's everywhere. Ohio, it's 50-50. In Ohio, it's 50-50? If you get divorced, you get half. She gets half. Gets Since when? Yeah. Huh? Since when? Since time. That's Since when? Since Through my three of them, I ought to know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's, it's just the way, the way they do yeah. it now. Yeah. Uh, another thing I was thinking of, if you had no marriage or you know, it would uh, could be you wouldn't know who was with it. There you, was uh, anybody would be come up and take take uh, your woman away from you. you okay. Know? So marriage makes a lot of difference. It's like not wearing a ring. So so <laughs> so uh, it's it's about that bonding commitment. Okay, to keep things clear that way. That probably cuts down on far, bar fights. <laughs> yeah. okay. I'm trying to speak practically here. How about children? When children are born, so uh, when, when, when the children born. come along, right. who's, somebody's got to take care of the kids. Whose yeah. child and who's responsible for it? Right. 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 These are all factors, and you you see why that cultural practice of marriage. Exists. Judge Judy will okay. tell you that. Judge Judy would be all over that, <laughs> wouldn't she? <laughs> so, so, um, so, yeah, we 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 live we will live with incredible freedoms here in America, and uh, so I think sometimes we get detached from some of these deeper cultural reasons for things happening. Uh, where it's all going to go, I don't know. Um, that's uh, that's that's kind of a big question mark in Western culture as we we explore the extents of our freedoms. Right? We can even change our genders now. <laughs> okay. Uh, and so they say. So they say. Well, now they also they, they just stay with we'll, we'll stay together. If we work out. We'll get married. Not okay. in our way. Yes, uh, that's become very common practice. But uh, the problem you have there is if you have a, something like being married, like you say you file your income tax, you have to get a divorce. I'm, I'm, I'm not following you, Jim. Okay, if you live with someone and not married, yeah. you file income tax together, you have to get a divorce because they consider you it's married. Probably. Oh, legally you're considered married after Oh, certain. oh, oh, I see. I see if you're filing joint returns. Right. Yeah, when I when I served as a pastor in Illinois, they also had a, a statutory marriage where, where after seven years, yeah. uh, common law marriage, I think is what they call it, common law. That doesn't exist anymore. That, that here. Not, doesn't exist in Ohio. doesn't exist in Ohio, but it, it did in Illinois. I don't know if it's still on the books in Illinois. But uh, but that probably goes back to like frontier days when they're when they're, you were out on your own kind of a thing and people got together and then you know uh, how do you how do you tell what belongs to who and all of that in those situations? Go ahead. That's still considered a sin. What's considered a sin? When they don't get married. Mm. It is. What do you think? I think it is. You think it is? My fourth wife said. <coughs> Your fourth wife? <laughs> Jim, I didn't know you had four wives. <laughs> no, one's all I can handle. Yeah. So, so, so a lot of the couples that come to me, Jim, have have that situation where they moved in together. Yeah. And uh, they they made personal commitments together, but they haven't made the public commitment. And this is always something that we talk about in the marriage counseling session. But you say the law. Still makes them uh, responsible after a certain time, right? Well, not not in Ohio. Now, in some states, they have what's called common law marriage, and if you live together for a certain number of years, uh, the law will treat you as though you are married, and that's intended as a protection to uh, women and children or whoever's weaker in the relationship. That's that's what that's about. Um, but uh, in Ohio, th that law does not exist. 
But if they have children, I mean, See? if they have children, then the rights pass to the child, and if the mother is the guardian, then. Yeah, I'm. I don't know the details of all of those laws, but they're they're intended for protections. Yeah. So yeah, be aware. Be aware. Go ahead. Um, I have had um, a friend that was a couple. Um, they claimed they were married in the eyes of the Lord. They okay. went off to a place, just the two of them. Yeah. They bowed before the Lord. They married themselves into the Lord without going through the state or anything. Right. And they felt like their marriage was blessed by God in doing that. Um, they said their vows before God. They did it in silent. They did it by themselves. And they felt they were married. But unfortunately, he came down with cancer. Mm. And because of the state laws, in order for her, they ended up on his you know, just a couple months before he passed away, they ended up going to before the judge to get married so the right. state would recognize it. But going before the Lord like they did, is that acceptable in the Lord's eyes? Mm -hmm. Is that a, is that a, I mean, or do you have to publicly do it before the Lord? Mm -hmm. and, yeah, the, the biblical practice that we see again and again it emphasizes marriage. Um, that, that's what you find again and again in the scriptures. And uh, the, we, really, we really love each other and, and, and uh, we're married in God's eyes, that kind of talk. I, I don't mean to insult anybody by the way I say this, but to, to me that sounds like hippie talk. Okay? <laughs> We're freewheeling. I, I just we're freewheeling, doing never, whatever, never, and and never. we're making a commitment, but maybe we're not. Yeah. Uh, that's 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 how it sounds to me. I know they were very close with the Lord, very Christian. Okay. I mean, they. Wonderful. I mean, oh, that's that's very, great. I, that, but I always wondered in the back of my mind if that was acceptable yeah. in the Lord's eyes. Yeah. I I guess the question I would ask is is, is uh, uh, the scriptures clearly talk about this? If, if you believe in what the Lord teaches and what the scripture says, why hesitate? If you're really committed to each other, why, why, why not, why not uh, sign the paper, piece of paper in front of a judge? You can do it very cheaply. It doesn't have to be expensive and a big wedding and all of that. Sometimes people get all anxious about that stuff. And that's, and that's not good. Uh, keep it simple. Uh, I have a, a, a sister, my sister Lisa and her husband, they eloped. Uh, but they did it with uh, the consent of the pastor. They went to his, went to the church. It was just them and the witnesses. And they got married. And uh, um, they're still together. They have two sons. Uh, very much in, in love and, and committed to each other. Um, uh, Grandma was a little upset for a while. <laughs> <laughs> Grandma was a lot upset for a while. <laughs> just, you know, we... we it, the, mar the marriage, it's about the two people, but then again, it's not. And I always counsel my couples and I say, you don't marry a family, but you do marry into a family. And you have to take all of that relationship stuff into account. It matters. Yeah. How about my sister? She I don't know about your sister. She didn't want to lose the, <laughs> the benefits of her first husband had died. Say, say again. She, she didn't want to lose the benefits of her first husband had died. She didn't want to lose those benefits. Sort of greedy. Okay. You know what I mean? Well, <laughs> well, I mean, she may have been dependent on those. I don't know her situation. She just likes money. Okay. <laughs> Some people do. <laughs> Karen, I'm going to let you. I'm going to let you and Doreen comment on this, and then we're going to move on. Isn't it a little bit like baptism that you you kind of have to have a someone who's kind of ordained or been blessed by the church to pass on that right to you as marriage? Well, we do, we do in the Lutheran tradition allow emergency baptisms. So, for example, a nurse at the hospital can perform a Christian baptism for a child who is uh, uh, in danger of death. Ordained. Say again? Even though she's not ordained. Even though she's not ordained. Yeah, the right does not depend on the virtue of the person administering it. Uh, if it did, uh, th this actually came up in the history of the church. There was a group called the Donatists uh, uh, were in North Africa. 
And uh, uh, when all of the persecutions were taking place, some of the, the pastors uh, uh, renounced their relationship to God and offered incense to the emperor uh, so they would get out of uh, punishment, persecution. And then the question came up, what about all those people that they had baptized? Are those baptisms valid? This guy's out of office because he you know, acted like a pagan. And, uh, and, the, and the church mulled that over and they said, it's not dependent on the individual. It's not dependent on that individual. It's the, the, and Luther emphasizes this in the catechism, that it's the word of God that makes a sacrament and not the person necessarily who speaks it. Okay? Yeah. How do we get off into that theology? I was trying to talk about <laughs> Dory, go ahead. You get the last word on this. Fast forward 2,000 years, a friend of mine was married and had two kids. Yeah. And he passed, and she couldn't get Social Security because they weren't married. Right. She got it for the two kids. Right. So that's, you know, if you want to talk money, you better think about that. Think, think through, think it all through. Yeah. Think it all through because the, the law is going to do what the law, whatever's on that book. The law is going to do. They're not going to have mercy. They do whatever's on that book in the law in the law cabinet. So uh, things things to think about as uh, as we care for each other. Let's see. Let's read chapter 22, 21 to twenty four. Uh, actually, I need two readers. Chapter twenty two. Who will take twenty one to twenty four? Raise a hand. Got it, Mike? Okay, and then I need someone to read 23, verse 9. There's similar laws here. Anybody over here? 23, verse 9, Susan? Yeah. All right, go, let's start with 22, Mike. Go ahead. All right. You shall not wrong a sojourner, sojourner or oppress him, for you were a sojourner in the land of Egypt. You shall not mistreat any widow or fatherless child. If you do not... If you do mistreat them and they cry out to me, I will surely hear their cry, and my wrath will burn, and I will kill you with the sword, and your wives shall become widows and your children fatherless. Hmm. Uh, 23 verse 9, Susan. You shall not oppress a sojourner. You know the heart of a sojourner, for you were sojourners in the land of Egypt. <coughs> What's going on here? Hospitality and church. Hosp hospitality? Like yeah, it's not focused on doing them. for them, though. It's focused on what? Not wronging them? Yeah, not wronging them. Don't mistreat them. Okay? Yeah, what's a sojourner? Stranger. What's a sojourner? Travelers. Travelers? King James has stranger. Stranger. Stranger danger. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we teach the kids, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so think about this law. What about illegal aliens coming into the states? Yep. Not good. What do you think? We're not to treat them any different or have ill feelings towards them, but I mean, we're all God's children. Okay. But what they cause in your uh, the economy and whatnot within your state or whatever if you get a bunch of them to your state mm. it, it's not fair and a lot of people you know they do they they hold a grudge against them mm. and also are they not supposed to follow the law and our law in the united states is they're not allowed to legally, illegally to come in mm -hmm. okay and that's the law i mean you can't say nothing about that okay it goes well with what said also the house is open and if they don't qualify for asylum, you can safely get them back to their country without wronging them. Okay. This is a huge is issue. Oh, it's a little big. Illegal, illegal aliens. Yeah. A huge issue yeah. in our nation. Uh, if you live in one of the border states, it's more than huge. <laughs> it's, it's, it's an incredibly big issue. And there are very different ideas about how to handle it out there. Yeah, Doreen. Well, I 
lived southwest, and there's a big population of uh, people from Africa and Hispanic people. Yes. They give them their driving test in their language. Yes. I have yet to see a stop sign done in Pakistani <laughs> or whatever. It scares me. Okay. I mean, you really have to be careful on that side yeah. of town with the people yeah. driving that can't read the signs. Yeah. Yeah, in Europe, a lot of the signs are just, they're actually signs or symbols. They don't have words on them. And that's probably because of the multiplicity of languages over there. Uh, but yeah, we certainly would want them driving safely. I didn't realize how much time had gone by here. <laughs> um, yeah, this, these passages are among those that are uh, for folks who want to... Uh, kind of have an open border and, and people coming in, uh, they will quote these passages to you about caring for the, the or not doing harm to the sojourner. And um, uh, we can certainly agree that, you, that people shouldn't be mistreated, should they? At the same time, I think, I think uh, a number of you who mentioned that there's, there's laws in our nation, and that we're a nation governs by laws, that those have to be respected and enforced. Uh, it's, it's, this is not an easy issue, but, but uh, we, we can't be mean to these people, okay? We should be just according to our laws and our expectations. Master, can I say one thing? Go ahead, Joe. Where I work at, they hired some Spanish-speaking people, and one of them actually told me I have to learn their language. Uh, they're not supposed to learn on it. No, that's wrong. I don't care what you say. Okay. I told them that, too. I don't care. Yeah, I, I, they're learning English. I told they're them, learning English. Well, I told them, I said, you know what? You're in our country. You learn our language and our ways. We don't have to learn your ways and your country you live to be. You come here to be free. Yeah. Set free from your, whatever is going on. But yet you don't respect us. Mm. It creates tensions, doesn't it? It does. I was in Costa Rica a few years back. And the dog was coming at me, chasing me. Yeah. I'm yelling, stop, stop, stop. That dog don't understand a word I'm saying. So I said, Alto. Alto. <laughs> but I did you know, I did not I didn't know Spanish that well. I could understand it. Yeah. I didn't speak it that well. Yeah. I knew something. And I finally got him to stop. <laughs> but it, it but it's I mean here's a here's an animal that is so so what you're saying, Jim, is is maybe learn just a few of their words. Yeah, right. <laughs> okay. Let's folks, let's bow our heads and have a prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, as we're looking at the law of Moses here, the law that you gave to your servant Moses for the people of Israel, we ask that you would grant us wisdom. We know that we're not justified by the law, and our and our holiness does not come from the law comes through our, our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet, Lord, help us to garner lessons from this as to how we should live our lives, how we should treat one another, and how we should honor one another as you call us to do. In Jesus' name, amen.